Okay, well, welcome everyone again. This is our session four, and I said that to the group yesterday that it seems like yesterday we just started and we only have one left to go, and that will be sometime in April. So um, at that point, we'll wrap up to June, and that will be our first year and gone through our, our new curriculum. And you know what, I think for the most part, um, as teachers always do, you've made it work in, in a phenomenal way and you've bridged gaps where you needed to bridge gaps. And in some places, the gaps will be still there in the following year. We'll just need a little more time um, and they won't be as big, but we just need to be patient with the students as they come through and, and with ourselves that we don't expect everything just to be perfect in, in right off the bat. It's going to take a, a good number of years until everybody's gone through the system and all of the kiddos that arrive at your doorstep in grade three have all the background knowledge that they would normally have had we sort of incremented this at smaller chunks. Okay, so we had talked a lot about in session three, um, sort of money on a number line. We looked at how that might translate into a calling it a unit fraction. Um, because as we're moving into this sort of part of our year at a glance, we're looking at that importance of unit fractions. And it's a really a big foundation to the new grade three curriculum. You are the building blocks for a whole lot of stuff that comes right after this in grades four and five. So um, there, there is no racing through that section. It's really one that you wanna hang your hat on and put the brakes on and spend the time. Um, it's new. It, it's not new in the concept, but it's new in the emphasis and how much and how we might unpack it. it might be a little bit, uh, depending on how long you've been teaching, you might be pulling out stuff where you say, I used to do that all the time. Um, a lot of that is going to be things that we're going to do again. So um, we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about that today. And I'm going to throw lots of things in the chat box. So if you have, if there's a couple of you, then and you've got access to grabbing your own laptop. If, if you prefer that, then just a heads up that you might want to do that as well. Okay, so let's move forward here. I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route to Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all of the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And so I've chosen that one because I am on Treaty 6 territory, but I am well aware that many of you are coming from 7 and 8 as well. Um, and this one comes from Bev Basie High School in Sherwood Park. I've been trying to grab from different locations so that we see different versions of it as well. Okay, so let's do what we've always done, and that would be looking sort of at our months and where we're at. Uh, we're going to start to see a lot less yellow highlighting. I mean, it still exists, but a lot less than we did at the beginning of the year because we're, we're at that point now where we're starting to slide into the actual learner outcomes version or wording. So up here, when we see three and two students apply addition and subtraction within a thousand, um, we are still working in, in a varied approach there. Some of you are well into the 600s. Some of you are, are not yet approaching 500. So there's a variation there, we know that, but we're now at the at sort of the midpoint of our year. And so we have that goal, our end goal in mind already. So our targets now and conversations will be moving, 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 moving towards that 1000. Uh, again, it's not a race, but we do want to keep that as our assessment focus in mind. That's what we're basing our assessments on for students. Um, when we look at some of the other pieces here, we're also really starting to work on um, assessing mastery of five by five. So I, again, some of you have said, um, you've been in touch with me and, and asked about, you know, is it just five by five that we would be doing? Like I've gone beyond that, or if I did the fives, I also went up to 10. And absolutely, like I agree. And I actually think that going to tens is the way to start is, is starting in that notion. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But what we want to do is do they have a good grasp on foundational knowledge of the math facts five to five? Can they demonstrate that? Not just memorized it, but how do they show it to you? How do they explain it to you? Or did they just memorize what the facts were? So then, then we have to be aware that they may miss some foundational understandings 
when they have word problems because there's no way for them to unpack what five times five means, okay, those types of things. So again, we'll revisit that, but we did a lot of that in the third session. So again, if that's just something that you wanna refresh, you might wanna have a look at that as well. Um, we're looking at strategies for multiplication and division. So we're working towards our hundreds. So 10 by 10, that's our end goal, right? Uh, and we can use our pennies and, and our blocks of, we'll refresh our memory on that one as well. And then we're moving into three and four, which is the fractions. And that's the one I kind of opened with. Um, the, the interpretation of fractions is got to go well beyond just it's a number over a number and this is the top and what we call it this is the bottom and what we call it and what the bottom reflects all true but very surface level and so in the emphasis uh, and i pulled it up here and highlighted it that the unit fraction is really where you want to start um, and it goes beyond just coloring a one out of seven out of seven pieces in a circle so we really want students to understand and how to find a unit fraction by themselves. So we did start to unpack that with the money in session three, where we put the dimes on the number line. We said, this is the first out of the 10 hops, the second out of the 10 hops. And then we asked the students to figure it out for nickels. And we asked the students to figure it out for quarters. We didn't just hand it to them and say, this is our first quarter, this is our second quarter. We want them to, to actually demonstrate that understanding so that when I get into some obscure number like one seventh and 11th, not that we absolutely would need those numbers to begin with anyway, but what do I do with that? How do I figure it out as a student? How do I figure out that that's one seventh and what's one ninth? So just that work that we did there where we brought up the different ways we divided up the line where we label the zero and the one, all of that piece happened in session three. But I do wanna go a little bit beyond that because that unit fraction is a big component of what happens, how they interpret addition, how they interpret multiplication. Uh, and that hits our students now in the new curriculum uh, in four and five much sooner than it ever has before. So that foundation will happen here. And that's where even if you need to revisit, you know, just to refresh and revisit um, a couple of times and, and maybe newer approaches each time so that they don't even realize that they're revisiting the same thing, um, it would be well worth our money to do that. Uh, so time is also one. Time is a, a piece that some of you have been doing ongoing, but if we look at our year to glance, again, it's, it's revisited. I can tie unit fractions into time, right? I, I can bring that component into an analog clock and leverage that for another revisit of unit fractions. We also are talking about measurement in this month and in subsequent months, and we're moving to standard. Up until now, they've been doing a lot of non-standard measurement, and now you are doing a lot of standard measurement. But that standard measurement is all premised on a unit fraction. So again, it, it, this is why I said that the emphasis of the unit fraction in grade three is so much bigger than it ever has been. And I'm, I actually think it's a good thing because we've lost too many kids along the way in fractions. And I think it just comes from that we, we've taught unit fractions, but maybe we haven't given it the emphasis that it needed. And so we just kind of assumed that they all understood what that all meant and that they would put the pieces together. And we find that students, when they struggle with fractions, they just struggle. And, and it's some of their parents, when you have parent-teacher interviews, you say, well, we're gonna be working on fractions. And you'll hear, oh, I could do fractions when I was in school. And they, I know that they probably won't be able to do them either. And I always used to chuckle and say to parents, well, you know what? The, they're not genetic, you know, it doesn't run in the genes. So we know there's, there's always that opportunity that we can maybe pick up some differences and see if we can figure it out for them. Um, but it's a word that people don't like and they're scared of it. And kids have heard it. They've heard it from their parents. Or, so they just think it, there's something to it, right? So again, I just want to reiterate that piece. So even in the, in the clock, we had highlighted that, you know, that we can use the clock for skip counting. We can use it for fractions. We can use it for angles. Um, there's all different components that we can use. It's not just about telling time. So those are other points that we kind of want to put in there. So again, when we look at March and April, and this is kind of when I say we're revisiting for mastery, you're not seeing different outcomes. The numbers are identical to almost what you started with in September. 
It's just the target and the goal is different. So if I started working towards mastery of 100 and I'm starting to work towards 1,000, that number target is what's different. What I'm checking for, how I'm approaching it, isn't any different. And that's why in this session, we also said we would try to bring up some new ways that maybe you can revisit. So it looks fresh to the students. They don't realize that they're actually just going back over and doing what they've always done um, with a new target in mind, that we're just redoing it in a, in a new way. So we'll try and throw some of those in today to hopefully give you some, some choices that maybe you can bring back and use different, different activities so it's not always the same thing. And you'll see that we have that unit fraction shows up all the way into April, right? It just continues to build. So we really want to work on that. We also want to look at, um, I'm just going to go back to this one here, the inverse proportion. Um, a lot of times that common misunderstanding that is one sixteenth bigger or smaller than one quarter. And most students will say, oh, one sixteenth is bigger because they're thinking in terms of whole numbers. They're not thinking in terms of the relationship of the numbers in a fraction. So we really need to go back and, and practice that with them and show them and give them practical opportunities to see what does 1 16th look like versus 1 quarter or 1 eighth. The other piece to the unit fractions that's absolutely critical and why we did better in fractions in years past, when we had the imperial system, the imperial system is built on fractions. The understanding of fractions was the foundation of the imperial system. When we went to metric, I'm not saying that fractions don't exist because they do. One tenth is the critical one there for sure, but it wasn't quite the same emphasis because we had a consistent fraction that was coming through. With the imperial system, Anybody who has parents that work in, in mechanics or they work in the trades of any kind, they have two sets of instruments, one imperial, one metric. They're not identical. There's just that small bit that's different. But when I look at the imperial case, I'm also looking at things like one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth. Well, those are where those numbers came from. So that's where that significance of the unit fraction too will play a huge role. In as we unpack the talk of, of uh, Imperial. Okay, we talked about those already. So let's get started maybe just at looking at some things that we can do for uh, a revisit on maybe the money. So when we look at re sort of recalling our addition and subtraction facts, um, when we're looking at adding two digit numbers, adding three digit numbers, if the only exposure they have had is the algorithm, or maybe a base 10 block, and I'm not saying base 10 blocks are wrong, don't misunderstand me, um, and they haven't got it yet, then maybe it's because the base 10 block is too abstract for them. So this is a good time for us to revisit and revisit again using money. Money offers us that opportunity to look at the base 10 system, just the same as our Cuisinaire or our uh, base 10 blocks, but it's real right? That I can put in my pocket. And now it, it maybe gives me a different way to look at why do I have to trade? Why do you want me to convert? Like, why do I have to do that? In a base 10 world of blocks, I don't walk around with those in my pocket. So everything you taught me is routine and not bad routine, just it's routine. You told me a little one is a unit and I need 10 of those to make what you called a rod. And you called it a rod. I didn't come up with that term. You told me that 10 rods, and I can show you how 10 rods make a flat. I know that. I can show you by lining them up. I know that if I make a cube out of 10 flats, I have 1,000. All true. All very abstract. And that doesn't really have a real world connection for a student because not a lot of them would understand what does that have to do with my day-to-day -day routine? It's the, the process that you're going through that has the day-to-day -day routine. It's not the blocks. And that's where we often lose students. They can't connect. That's the concept we're trying to teach them as opposed to the blocks themselves. So when they don't understand regrouping and they're not strong in regrouping, that's part of the problem is they haven't connected to the abstractness. 
So let's just back it up. And we can even say, we're just gonna review. Let's make sure everybody's good on adding two digit numbers, whatever, wherever you're at, okay? So this is a template that you're looking at right now that we just created because we had a lot of schools that were asking about, you know, we're struggling with group regrouping, kids aren't getting it. So we said, okay, let's put away the base 10 blocks and let's just go back to money. And let's, let's base only the money on base 10. So that's why you're only seeing the loonies, the $10, the hundred and thousand dollar. And I'll talk about that one in a minute. We don't want the pennies right now. In grade four, we, we do. There's a bigger sheet for the grade fours. But right now we just stick to the base 10. So here's my one, here's my tens, here's my hundreds, here's my thousands. We put the thousand dollar bill on it, even though it's no longer in circulation, so that it helps students to have a place, an actual tangible bill for that thousands place. And it makes it a little bit easier for me to even navigate the conversation about what does $10,000 look like? Well, it would look like 10 of those. Now they're not in circulation. We put that underneath. They're not legal tender any longer. They no longer print them. Um, they used to print a $500 bill and they don't do that anymore either. But we just wanted to put it up there just like the penny to say they did exist. We're gonna leverage it and use it as a placeholder so that we have something that you can physically hold in your hand. Um, and then I can also bring out 10 of those and show them that that's 10,000. And I could stack them and show them that this is what 100,000 would have to get to, right? So um, that bill, that $100,000 bill, what I did is I enlarged them. I think there's eight on a sheet. And if you go into the Moving Forward website, uh, under the math kits, again, remember that's in the additional resources, go into the math kits, either grade two or grade three, doesn't matter. You'll find them at the very bottom where the templates are, like this template is there as well. And then you'll find $1,000 template. So you can just print them off. You don't need tons of them. But again, it depends on where your students are at and their understanding, it, it gives them that connection. And so we are, we're doing a ton of work with this. And what I've actually done even with grade twos, because we're using the same one in grade twos, only we're not giving them the thousand dollar one right now, just going up to a hundred, um, where I, I would go in with that math app that I showed you numerous times already, where you can just go in and I just randomly, I bring it up on their smart board and I just, I just drag out, you know, literally tons of $10 bills and tons of loonies. And then we say to them, does anybody see anything that could be regrouped and converted into something else. Don't tell them which one it is. That's all I just say. And they're at a point now where they their own hands up, they come up, they grab the pen, they will circle 10 loonies. We just X out anything that's in the circle to know that those are gone. And then they get to, with their finger, drag out another $10 bill. And they're, they caught onto that really quickly, but that's for some of our kids who are struggling with regrouping. Maybe that's what we need to go back to. And then we do the same thing. Any more coins that we can do, somebody else come up. And then when they say, no, there's no more. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, there's lots of $10 bills. Okay, well, then somebody come up and do those. And then they trade that for 100. They like that they can drag the money, but but it's that it's the converting piece, right? It's the regrouping that I wouldn't want to. Because when I say to them, I want to take away nine from 21. And we say, we're gonna go borrow from the tens position, cross it off and put a one here and then add that 10 over here and make it 11. That's procedure. Unless I understand exactly what you are doing. When I do it backwards, I can say to them, you know what, I don't have, I don't have nine loonies to take away from that 21. So where could I get more loonies from? Well, you could go get, go trade in a $10 bill and make, another 10 loonies. That procedure, it sounds so elementary, and yet for some kids, they need to see that in action and do it. And then it starts to connect. Oh, that's what we were doing when you did that. So we do tons of questions like that, where I simply ask them, show me, show me $32. They lay out three tens, two loonies. Show me $54, right? And I give them tons of questions that are not regrouping, and then when I say add them together, they know that that means put the tens together, put the loonies together, and then we check. Do you have too many loonies that you're going to be walking around with in your pocket? Can you trade any of them in? That conversation. And then we tool it up to hundreds for the grade threes. We get into the hundreds. So we do the same kind of, of conversation. The other part about the regrouping piece is sometimes the students don't know their numbers, right? So a nice quick 
um, activity. Again, it's just a refresher. I'll put this one into the chat box as well here so we can use it. It's one of the few that you actually can still access the abacus. Chat box, there it is. Okay, it's up in the chat if you want to grab it. So with an abacus, uh, unlike a rec and rec, remember the rec and rec, they're all either red or white in combination. An abacus, a true, this true abacus, because the other true abacus, uh, the ones that are still being used in the um, Arab countries are all the same color. They're wooden and they're brown. It's the position of the bee that will determine how the abacus works. But an abacus has also been always referred to as sort of the, the initial, um, this is our first computer that we had. And that computer was based on certain values and certain positions of, of numbers. And, and that's exactly it. That's exactly what this was. So in an abacus, if you haven't used a lot of these, the lowest, these are all based on place value. So this isn't just, different colors, all the same bead. This is your ones at the very bottom. This is your tens, your hundreds, your thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, et cetera, right? So as I get into the higher grades where I have to get into the millions and the 10 millions, I have a place to go here. And what I would simply do with this is just also just, they kids like it for one, it's fun. But secondly, find out if they even know their numbers. Just you know, say, can someone show me 124? So 100, and I have a, a template, if you want it, I'm not sure if I put it in your folder, but if, if it's helpful to you, I can send it to you, uh, where I've labeled it ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, so the students can do a quick reference, just having a, a, on their desk. But if I ask them to show me 124, I need to know that this is the hundreds row. I push them over to the right because we're used to using the rec and recs and dragging to the left, there's no significance to going to the right on a, on a abacus. That's just something that somebody said, we're well, gonna to go to the right. Uh, I like to keep things consistent for kids so they're not confused. So here's my 124, great. And then you could call out numbers like, can you show me 2,465? And then as they start to get good at that, you might wanna double check what happens if you had a number that had a zero intentionally, let's say in the hundreds or in the tens, what happens then? Like, what do they do? What happens when they say, when you say, can you show me 205? And remember it's not 205 because and is a decimal. So can you show me 205? So they might go and grab the five here, which is typically what they do. Um, but then they'll say, well, what about this row? What are we supposed to do there? I don't know. Let's write that number down again and let's just look at that zero position. What is that telling you? It's telling you that you had no tens. So did you move any tens? No, right? It's just getting them to see whether they know. You don't need to spend tons of time on here, but the abacus is a great place for them to see whether or not they know their values. They can also add three digit numbers and two digit numbers. Like I could say, for example, can you, I'll just pick a really fast one here, 200 and, 32, okay, and to that I want to add 451, so 450 and one, okay, and what if, let's just say I had, I added something where I run out of numbers, let's say that I've got, what do I have here, two, four, six, seven, so let's say I had an eight in my number, so I would move this over, oh, I don't have eight, there's no eight to push there, so what they have to learn then, here's their regrouping. I have one that I still need to do. So I'm going to push those back and trade it for a 10. And now I can take the one that I was missing from the eight. I was only able to push seven. Now I'm pushing the eighth one. So that's how the regrouping happens. You can do addition to billions on here if you want. Like this is a, a neat little tool. It's a nice way for them to see that they can add numbers in different ways. Okay, so we've also used money. Right, and that's our other big piece that we can access at any time and have students regroup it. So you can just randomly drag out a whole bunch of values here, just any time, and then they could do the circling like I was saying. If you really feel strongly that you need to have columns in your questions, you can take the pen at the bottom and draw a column in here, but I don't. I don't know that they need them, 
it's, it's the concept of the trade and convert that we're trying to ensure that those kids who are struggling with um, the blocks and, and, and can't figure out why I can't take something away, that regrouping piece, that conversation. Okay, I'm gonna throw this one back in the chat box. You may have it already earmarked or bookmarked on your computer, but just wanna do a couple of things with me. Okay, so if you wanna grab that one. Oh, that one didn't go through. Let me just try it again. Not the same toy theater one. Okay, let's try that one one more time. There it is. Okay, there it is now. So again, I can do all kinds of work with even Cuisinaire rods, right? That gives me the alternative when I'm looking at what are ways that I can show a number? What are ways that I can um, show addition of a number? Uh, I can do the same thing with the Cuisinaire rods. And that's a piece that we sometimes forget about when we do unit fractions, right? That's another piece that I wanna add into that conversation. So I could take the Cuisinaire rods and I can even have money on my table. And I could say, you know, what is the connection we even asked this of grade twos the other day. What's the connection between the 10 cents that you have on your desk right now? We had 10 pennies. What's the connection between what you're looking at and what you see here? And some of the kids, I mean, they had to think about what we were asking them, but some of them were pretty perceptive and said, well, this is like one penny and this would be like two pennies. This is three pennies, four pennies, five pennies. And then they were quick to say, but the five pennies, you could make that a nickel. And then they just kept going and then they got down here and said, well, that's like a dime. So having that connection between a shape and money, again, if you ask me to add something together with a Cuisinaire rod and I get stuck, I have something to fall back on. If I get stuck on a base 10 block, I could say, okay, that little square is just like a dollar. It's a loony. And that rod is a $10 bill. Right, just so I have another, maybe it's the block that is, is giving them the grief and not so much the concept. And so again, I have opportunities then where I can take these numbers and I can say, can you show me 22? Well, yeah, I can. And if you do it most efficiently, then I wanna see it in the smallest way that you can. All right, so I would be able to show me a number that way. And then again, I could do the same thing. Can you show me 35? Can you show me 37? And for each one of those that extends, I'm just gonna grab one down here. Let's say I took a nine and I added a five to it. Well, I already know that that's too long. So I have to convert some of this into a new orange block and then I can put the rest in. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this part gets to become 10 and now I'm gonna lose this out of the yellow because that's what helped make the new orange one. And that means that it will be one smaller, so it'll be the pink one. So again, it's just the notion of regrouping to keep the rules the same, right? That's, that's the only thing that we're doing. Some kids struggle with that whole notion. Okay, let's do another one. Um, you might want to just jot this one down. Uh, all capital letters, winter 23. Marianne, I know you have this one for sure, or not Marianne, Anne-Marie. Uh, Braining Camp is, has been around for a little while, but they keep improving their product. If you haven't seen it, you can sign up using that um, passcode that I just shared with you. And that will give you more than a 30-day trial. Um, Ryan will actually extend it to three months. So it's a, a place that you can go to and, and use um, pretty freely. They have all of these manipulatives on there and, and you don't have to sign up right now if you, unless you have it and then you can follow along with me. But what I'd like to do is let's leverage now the conversation about even, even a unit fraction. I'll go back to, to the tiles here, the Cuisinaire rods in just a second. But if I wanted to do not so much regrouping right now, if I wanted to talk about parts of, in the Cuisinaire rods, I had an orange that was 10. How can you show me 10? Well, I could pile a whole bunch of things on there. And as long as there's no holes and there's no gaps in it, there's 10. 
but what if I said the, the lines could only have the same colors on them? Well, that limits what I can show you for 10 then. I could only have, and I'll just skip back one, I could only have two yellows because that's kind of where we started our year off actually. There's the same color and that means that each one of these is exactly one half of my orange. How do I know that? Because it divided it equally into two pieces and there's nothing hanging over. So a yellow would be an example of a unit fraction for the orange. It happens to be one half because it was one of two equal pieces. Does the orange have any other unit fraction possibilities? Not everything does. And in this case, yes, it does because I could take the red and I can put the reds on top of here and that's five of them, five times two is 10. So that means that the red is also a unit fraction of the orange because one red represents one out of five possible hops to make that particular shape. So here's my one fifth is there anything else that the orange has? Yeah, it does. It has the potential. We won't build it all, but I could take 10 white ones and line them all up here and that would give me 10 as well to prove to you I know it's 10. So that means that each one of these is one tenth. This is your dime to your loony. That's the equivalent right there. So then if this is how we have to start getting kids to think in terms of unit fractions, not just the number over the number, and here's a circle and it's been divided into seven pieces and can you find one of those seven and shade it in? All true, but that's pretty surface level and it doesn't necessarily mean they understand. You could even enrich the question by saying, what are the unit fractions for every other colored rod that we didn't do? We did the orange. What's the unit fraction for the blue? What are the unit fractions for the brown? Some of them, we're only gonna have one possibility. It'll only be the white one. Others will have multiple ones just like the orange one did. So then if we do that kind of work with the unit fraction conversation, what happens when we get our pattern blocks out? They're great for patterns. They're great for all kinds of things. They're super for fractions. But how would you show me what are the unit fractions that are possible for a hexagon? And are there unit fractions possible? So that means I need to be able to cover this just like the rod in a color without having any holes and any gaping pieces. So I can get that out of there, there we go. I can duplicate this one. And when I do that, I can also just put it in here. I'm gonna flip it over, slide it in, and I can do this. And eventually what I'm gonna find out is that I need six of these triangles and I will end up with coverage. Okay, well, that means that one of those triangles represents a unit fraction for the hexagon. What is the unit fraction? It's the first one out of six. So it's one sixth. What else does the hexagon have as a possible unit fraction? Well, are there any other shapes that you can cover? Well, I could take the red one. Yep, that works. I can flip this guy over as well. And there's my one half. So one red trapezoid is one half. What else do we have? I can take the blue one. And it's gonna take three of these. When I put them on. Oops. That's a very good one, there we go. So now I have a one third. So then I would ask students if they really are getting the idea of what the one of something, the unit is, what is the, is there, and it's not what is, is there a unit fraction for the trapezoid? If it is, what is it? And what number would it represent? Is there a unit fraction for this one? Is there a unit fraction for this one? No, it's actually the unit that gets used for most of the shapes. Is there a unit fraction for the square? that we have that we can convert and put in here. Some kids will say it's a triangle and we put it in there. No, nope, that doesn't work. So again, they can find that it takes three 
for this three green triangles for the red trapezoid, so that's one third. It takes two in this one to give me one half, et cetera. Now there are additional pattern blocks and I bring that to your attention for a couple of reasons. Let me clear them out here. If you go down to the bottom where it says workspace and you select Desi, well, let's go fraction first. Let's do fraction first. You'll see that I have my traditional ones that I see here, but then you have this little odd character sitting there. You can buy these now, but this guy is quite unique. And I would never tell students where it fits. I would ask them, where does it fit? Where does this go? Anywhere that it can cover a surface? Like, will it fit in here? Might. Can you flip it over? Oh, not that direction. Hmm, yeah, I could. So there's two that go in there. So two of those fit into here. Well, if two of those fit into the red trapezoid, that would mean that four of them would fit in here. So now, instead of just having the simple fractions that we had possible in the first set that we created, we've created a third, we created a half, a sixth. Um, now I have a quarter, right? Now I have a new half represented. What about this little character? How does he fit into the game, right? So again, we have them just try it out and see what goes on. And this is half of the green one. So this green one was one sixth of the hexagon, then the purple will be one twelfth of the hexagon. Again, and it just gives us more fractions to work with. The other ones that come out into play now, I purchased these quite a while ago, but and they're very good. You'll see that we have these new blocks and they don't work in isolation of the originals, they work with the originals. And so I'm not gonna go through them now, you can play with these. These are called the Desi blocks. So the first question I ask students is, using any one of these guys, what is the unit value of these new shapes that we've added in? So they need to find what's the unit fraction. They'll find out which shape it is that can build that fraction. And remember to be a unit fraction, it has to have the same color covering it all the way through. So I'll leave that one for you to consider, but this offers you every possible fraction you can think of. There's no unit fraction that you can ask the student to create that would be out of the realm of a pattern block. And we needed those newer ones to do that because we couldn't do that with the original ones. Also built into your folder, I just put in here just another way, it's kind of like a graphic organizer. If I'm looking at bigger numbers, can they describe it by using money? Can they try to describe a diagram, maybe using another manipulative? So just again, making them think in terms of other things, not just one tool fits all for everything and or it's just for one thing and then we pack it away and we never see it again. Also, when you're doing products because you're working on five by five, 10 by 10, right? That's your goal. So you might be even further than that. Sometimes we talk about in the addition parts, how can I break something up and make it into a partial product? And a lot of times students say, I don't really understand what that means. So we can sketch it out on grid paper with them. This is a new, neat little tool. I'm not sure that you would use it a ton, but let's say I wanted to show five times five as a partial product. You can change it to anything. It doesn't have to be identical either. It could be six times seven or whatever. But how it works is you just move it along. And as I move it along, you'll see at the bottom how it changed. So I've taken my five by five and broken it into five times two. It's highlighted them for them. Here's five by three. And that's the same thing as five by five, right? So they can see how they get broken up. They can do it vertically and they can do it horizontally, whichever way you want. So they can work their way up to 10 by 10. And what are the partial products? Um, because sometimes they just learn certain times tables, they just make sense to them. And then based on that, I can see it visually. And then I just have to add another group of whatever onto it. So that's just a tool for you to use as well. This digital toolbox, I'm not going to go into it, is just a free toolbox of resources. It is not specific to unit fractions or anything. It's got any and everything a teacher could want, probably way more than you would need for grade three but it's just a toolbox for the teacher. So I just threw it in there because it was, we could access it for free. And it has so many different things in there that I think would be helpful. Also in your folder, I put uh, for the grade three class that I worked with last year, 
when we were doing the math facts, we created a, a foldable for them. So this is the front and back. Here's the front, here's the back. I'll show you how it works right away. This is the one page and you just print it back to back to the next sheet that you're gonna see. And they just decide, they just write on here, what facts are we working on? This is the sixes, this is the nines, the eights, whatever. Um, and then they can fill in their groups of. The inside is the one that's a little bit more uh, important. So you just fold it over. So this is your front and then just a simple fold. On the inside, it would look like this. There's another single sheet where you can just photocopy the inside. The center here is for a problem. So you give them a problem that's well out of their reach right now in math facts, but that they, by the time they've finished that math fact that you're working on, they would have a, a fighting chance of answering that question. So, and some students will answer it way before halfway through, like they've already figured out how they can leverage what you've taught them to uh, answer the question. But here they have a picture, they can draw groups of, they can do arrays of, um, they can use the number line if they're gonna show it that way, they can do a grid representation if they're gonna do that partial product, whatever representation they want. This is just a way for them to unpack their math facts other than just memorizing it. So that inside of the foldable helps to get to these pieces here. So in here, I won't go to this one, but when you click it on, um, one of the questions that's been asked in, in another session was, is there a right order to teaching math facts? And it kind of goes to that question of the teacher who asked about, you know, like five by five, is that really where we're at? That's all as far as we went, or could we have been doing tens already? So in that list, there is not one exclusively correct way of teaching math facts in order, um, but there are some that have been shown to be very much more productive for students and make more sense to them. And so that's what I've outlined here. It's a possibility, I'm not saying it is the possibility, but it's a very common one that many people use. So you can click that on and just go through. It's another slide deck. Uh, we've been talking about unit fractions, so it's really important. And it's important that they have a, a frame of reference of whatever units I'm talking about with you. Where does zero fit in? Where does the halfway mark fit in? And what does the whole look like, right? So that they have a good sense of, I have nothing to a whole, and where's about the halfway mark of this whole, whether the whole is eight, sevens, whatever it is, right? They need to be able to do that. So strong understanding of unit fractions. These are important ones because they really build on the imperial system that we're gonna look at as well. There are additional things that you can do for unit fractions and you're, you're sort of stuck to a denominator of 12 is what you're supposed to sort of limit yourself to. Uh, and again, I would not worry about the odd ones like the 11s and the sevens. I mean, we so seldom ever see those for anything, stick to the most practical ones. Um, but you also have to recognize that an imperial ruler would use sixteenths, and your clock is a sixtieth, which we already said that to the uh, to the Alberta ad saying you said it to limit to twelve, but if we're going to talk about minutes to an hour and seconds to a minute, then we're talking about one sixtieth, and they said, yep, yeah, it's in the document. So well, that's not a denominator of twelve. So just be aware, right? If they're strong in unit fractions, going to 1 60th isn't going to make a big difference. Um, there are some uh, information in there that you can use on the uh, website again for rulers. And so just to clarify, what is my role as far as imperial and what are we doing for conversions? We're not doing anything with, with the formula. There's nothing heavy duty about it. Um, the kids actually quite like it because they they are excited to find out that they could have been, there's another way to measure, right, that they didn't know about. Um, this is your math kit that I'm in right now. And there are two sets of rulers up here that you have access to. And you can photocopy them for the kids if you want, not whatever, whatever works for you. Okay, that's not what I was looking for on that side. So, all right, I'm not sure what's happening here. That doesn't usually happen. Either way, when this gets printed properly, um, I had lined them up so that they're facing in the same direction. Often when you get rulers right now, you have imperial and metric, but one goes this way and then the other one goes this way. So it doesn't help for comparison. And all they need to do in grade three is, you know, what is one inch approximately? So they can even take a piece of paper and just run it down. It's about 
2.5 centimeters, right? It's not, we don't have any formulas here. It doesn't have to be the perfect 2.54. That's, that's not what it's all about. So we are looking at really just trying to make some comparisons. Do they have a meter stick and a, and a yard stick? And, and how are they different and how are they similar? Um, in this section called K5 Learning, I'm gonna put this into the chat box. If you have not bookmarked K5, these are specific examples, but that's fine. I would suggest maybe doing that. Okay, and I'm stuck here, there we go. Okay. K5 is um, a site where you can go in and download everything for free. There's no copyright that you need to worry about. It is a um, subscription service, but only for maybe one tenth of it is subscription. The rest of it is all just for free. So what I went through is I just went to see what they had in here for metric and, and imperials. So there's a number of different ones. You don't have to worry about weight right now. So you're just looking at these and it's just taking a ruler and making those comparisons, having them say, how long is your hand in inches? What in the room would be six inches long? What in the room would be one inch long? Um, and then making that comparison to the, um, the uh, metric system as well. So just that's the kind of thing that they're gonna do. Where the unit fraction though really does play a bigger role will come in when we look at um, the, the breakdown of the unit fractions that are found on, um, on a ruler, right? So they need to understand what is one eighth, what is one quarter, because those are the foundation of an imperial ruler. And we're not big on, on getting into in, uh, equivalent fractions right off the bat. We don't have to name it right off the bat. They just need to be able to count by quarters, count by eights. And yes, when they get to one quarter, it's the same thing as two eights, but they should see that on the ruler, right? We, we shouldn't have to tell them right away how to do that. So those are the pieces for Imperial that you really wanna spend a little bit of time on, um, but it's not an overkill. It's an understanding of, do I know how to compare? And that's really all that we want them to do, right? Here's your enlargement. So yeah, it's 2.54, a little bit over, but this just gives me a good way for me to see how it looks. Here's my enlargement for my unit fractions. So if I'm skip counting by one eighth, this is my first one eighth, my second one eighth, my third one eighth, my fourth one eighth, my fifth one eighth, right? It's counting on a number line by one eighth. That's at zero to one. Where's my whole, what's happening in between? It's an eighths in this case. It could be sixteenths, it could be 30 seconds, right? There's, there's different ways that we can express them. So these are the common ones that we would want to make sure that they're really good at when they're doing their unit fractions because they're gonna see those more and more and more as we start doing more work in uh, the world of uh, Imperial. Uh, and this is just the estimation, you know, how long is my hand in inches? What's a, good, what's a good referent for me to go and measure the height of the door? My body would be a good one, right? And how long is my body in centimeters? How long is my body in inches? just having that conversation. All of this stuff can be just done together. It's not like we have to do a unit on measurement and a unit in fractions. We just tie them all together and do them all at the same time. Skip counting by one eighth. I'm skip counting by an eighth. I'm skip counting by a quarter. I'm skip counting by a tenth. So that they understand that fractions are numbers on a number line, right? A lot of kids miss that whole concept. Okay, we talked about measuring already. We could take measurement in time and put it out linearly if it would help them to see how that works. Because we always see them in a cycle. We see the clock in a cycle. The 24 hour clock is just a number on a screen. So how does that work? Well, then I can show them even if I stretch it out in a linear fashion. These are just from one of the books that Marian Small had written, uh, just a revisit of just when you were teaching minutes and seconds, what are things that we could consider as a teacher? So again, what are some questions that you could ask them? Just to engage them in that. These don't have to be super long, three weeks long lessons, but we need to just keep revisiting so that they start thinking in terms of time, but thinking in terms of fractions, thinking in terms of intervals of things going by, that type of thing. Uh, okay, we talked about the unit fractions. We looked at Mathagon is another one where you have clocks on here. So that link has been done for you. 
And again, a student's not all of our students know um, clocks as analog clocks, right? They're quite versed in clocks being uh, just hit my watch and it will tell me or my phone and I know what time it is. So in Mathagon, you have, and this is free as well, you have three different clocks. This one is showing me absolute accurate time right now. So we are at nine minutes to five. So we're getting there. Why I like this, this setup is because for some students, they have no idea what elapsed time is. And they also don't even know how long a minute is. So we can say to them, okay, as soon as it gets to 12, nobody talks. And then they watch it go all the way around so that they understand the feel of one minute. How long is one minute of silence? Right? We could talk about it. One minute of silence on Veterans Day. Like just connect it to something. This one allows them to see when I manipulate the second hand. Remember, every time I go around, it moves one minute. Well, I don't necessarily see that as I'm tracking this one. I'm not going to see that movement. But here I can, when I grab it, I can see the large hand change, right? And I can say to the kids, watch that large hand. Okay, now I can see it. They can see it move. So they now get that perception of this once around is 60 little dots I've gone through, 60 seconds, and it moved it one minute. So then over here, what I have is the ability to change it. So I can say, can you show me 250? Can you show me... 215, can you show me whatever? So they can manipulate the hands to show us what the time would be, right? And they would adjust it so that it works accordingly. So this is from Mathagon, and that's a good one for time. Again, it's not something you're going to spend hours and hours on, but it's a great revisit. We can go up and say, oh, it's 10 after two. What does that mean? What fraction of the time of the hour have we used, right? We used 1 12, 2 12 if we're going in groups of fives, or we've used 10 sixtieths of the time in a minute or hour, whatever, whatever your reference is. Okay, some books that may be in your school already and maybe you haven't connected to uh, for a while. These are from Origo. They're fundamentals. I like the books because they have, by the name, fun. They are game formats that fit outcomes. And that's what I like. I like something that's targeted towards an outcome. These are games that are in black and white. They're usually one page. So they're really an easy thing for a teacher to take into the classroom. Usually it would be like grab a couple of dice or you know things that we would readily have. It's not like we have to go buy something to make these work, but they're targeted to outcomes. And so now I can really keep practicing my move forward, but in a fun way. So they might be some that you might wanna consider. They come in different grades as well. Like there's, um, the colors ridge over grades. So this is one, two, two, three, three, four. Um, for grade threes, I would go into the three, four book for sure, because some of their fours are definitely going to be some of our grade three stuff. They have a four, five book, a five, six book. So again, I would grab from any one of those, depending on the outcome that we have, because they've been downloaded. And then some teachers have been asking for open-ended kinds of questions, like not just right or wrong. And that would be just surface level, right? We want to go beyond just surface level. The Rubicon books, um, these are by strand. So these are based on the old, but they're outcome based. So again, we can just go look for the outcome we want to do. And what they do is they have four, in this case, they have four grades in uh, the, the beginner books. And they ask an open-ended question. It's usually a fairly easy one, but it's not just one answer. Like it could be multiple possible ways to get there. Uh, and then they make it a little bit more difficult. And then they ask a, a little bit more of a more difficult one and not difficult in the sense that nobody could do it, just drawing in more of the outcomes. So if you're looking for something like that to just keep kids critical thinking going, um, this would be a good resource. There's a number strand book, the, um, the geometry one, I think is a green color. There's one for data management, like there's one for pretty much every strand that we used to have. Um, and I have them all, they do come in French as well for people who want them in French. The fundamental books do not come in French. The information that I got for the clocks and measurement and things like that comes from Marion Small's book. This is not a book for students. This would be a book for you, the teacher. If you're looking just for something to refresh your own memories, I, I use this as my quick reference all the time. Um, it has about uh, 600 pages. There's of those 600, lots of explanations just to review our thinking again, if we haven't done something for a while. 
but also they give you student exemplars and they show you why the student missed it. Like what, what is it in their response that really just isn't quite there? They're not getting it. Um, and I find those always really helpful too, just to refresh my own memory. Okay, wow, we did it. We, we did it in just, I think we're just at five o'clock. Are there any questions at all from anybody? I'll stop our recording here so that nobody feels like they have to talk and be recorded at the same time. If my mouse would just get over here. Come on, work with me here. There we go. Chris, I just have a question about the spirit of the curriculum in with regards to clocks. Like, are they wanting students to tell to the nearest minute or nearest five minutes? What What is the expectation?